So, so when I was a Boy Scout, one of the highlights of every camping trip was the campfire. It was like a really big deal. And when we were preparing for the campfire, it was the idea of you know, warmth, light, um, cooking, hopefully, and uh, you know, kind of gathering together to share stories. And it wasn't the campfire itself, though, that was all the work for us, right? It was the parts that you had to do beforehand. So we would actually go out and spend hours gathering wood. Um, and this seems like a really mundane and trivial task, but it was critical to getting that like roaring killer fire that we were all like really looking forward to. And so we would all gather together at the campfire ring. And from the campfire ring, we would send everyone dispersing in different directions, right? So you just imagine all these like teenage boys running out into the woods and we would all be looking first for tinder. We'd say, everyone look for tinder. So find some leaves and bark and stuff that'll go up easy. And then you would call out, okay, we've got enough of that, let's get some kindling. And you keep going up the, the fire food chain, so to speak, to get to fuel. You know, you, need, you want big logs, right? You want a big fire, you need big logs. You have to build up to that. And as you were doing that, you inevitably ran into obstacles, right? You would be have streams to cross, rocks to climb over, and you would get to explore all around the campsite. And then you'd also have to kind of pick up on the nuances of looking for it, right? Like you'd have to know, okay, it rained the night before, so anything on the ground is wet and useless. So one of the older guys would probably tell you, you know, look up in trees, look for dead branches up there and you'll find dry wood. And that's just kind of all the little different skill sets you would pick up over time. So I think as you listen to everyone talking today, and I, I kind of expected this to happen. You hear about a lot of people doing a lot of these little tasks and picking up skill sets and talking to other people and picking up things. And in my mind, I think of that as gathering wood, right? Because we talk about the spark part, about building a startup company and all these things, and that moment of ignition. And that's what we looked forward to as kids, right? Like, oh man, we get to play with matches today. Um, but really, it's all the work that builds up to that that you guys need to hear about and you need to understand in order to kind of come forward. And I'm right now in the middle of that wood gathering process personally, and that's what I do at Sound Park. That's my, my big roaring fire for you. And so at Sound Pipe, what we're doing is we're trying to develop an ultrasound catheter for drug delivery. And I didn't come up with that idea. I joined as a graduate student at UVA, and my PhD advisor and his collaborators they came up with this idea that we can paint blood vessels with drug to get more efficient drug delivery and get it on target in diseased vessels. While you're doing that with this incredible ultrasound catheter, you can also get images and actually track what you're doing in real time so you know, did you treat effectively or not? So I did that for five years. Really exciting project to me. Um, you know, and I did what every graduate student, and all you guys are an undergrad are doing too, right? You go out, you learn a few things, you run some simulations, you make a prototype, you break a prototype, you come back, you make another one, you break another one, and I still do that now. But anyway, it was a pretty typical experience. I had a lot of fun. I learned about a lot of the intersecting science and pieces, like these, these drug-loaded bubbles that we use for the drug delivery, I had to learn about that, and vascular biology, and all sorts of stuff. But at the end of it, I got a PhD, like every other PhD student does, and graduated and said, I'm gonna move to Boston, got a lease, my wife and I, and we were packing and getting ready to go. So this is where things got a little unusual for us, I suppose, because I got a phone call from my advisor, John Hasek, and he said, listen, Joe, Brian Wompoff and I, we think that we can start a company out of this technology, and we think that we can get this to patients and we can help those patients. Are you interested in being our technical lead? So, yeah, of course, right? This is, you've spent five years working on this, countless hours in the lab, a lot of ruined weekends, and absolutely. Of course, I had to go talk to my wife and think things over a little bit, but ultimately I came around to it, yes, let's do this. I was gonna be their technical lead. Now, I'm gonna pause on that because I wanna emphasize that. I was going to be a technical lead. I was going to be an engineer. I wasn't going to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't going to found a startup. I wasn't going to do any of these things that I did not believe I could do at the time. My wife and I had actually joked a few weeks back about how I could not do that. <laughs> yeah. 
So then I said, all right, okay, what do we do next? I'm signed up. And he said, well, we need money. So I quickly lost my safe engineering role, and so we went out to get a grant, um, a federal grant called an SBIR grant. Anyone who's looking to start a company, look into that, they're awesome. It's non-dilutive, and you write a six-page application that says what your technical feasibility is, which I had that down pat, that was great. And then you have to do this like business feasibility. And that's where you have to say, okay, well, where do we get the IP from? All right, well, we're gonna license that from UDA. What's our regulatory pathway? Um, how are we gonna get access to the equipment we need that we had at UDA, but oh, we, we don't have UDA lab access anymore. We need a lab, where do, where do we put the lab? And you just, it keeps snowballing into all these things that like your normal bench engineer, what I aspired to be at a young age, was, was not accustomed to figuring out. So, I gathered wood. I went out and I started looking for these, this information and all these things, and I met a ton of people that gave me that information and helped me understand. And this is one thing that, to kind of highlight Charlottesville a little bit, Charlottesville is an incredible community. We have so many people here that sat down with me when I had like no money, no lab, no equipment. Um, and there are quite a few of them in here today that spoke to me and you know spent time with me and said, oh, well, if you need this, go talk to that guy. Or, oh, if you need this, I can help you with that for now and help you figure that out. And so I took advantage of that. And I just kind of kept going around, getting a feel for the landscape around our technology and our concept and, and all the things we needed. Submitted that grant application, submitted it again because we didn't get it the first time, and then we managed to get funding. And that was super exciting. So then, you know, we got going, we were developing the technology, doing the groundwork, making things, and then we got this incredible opportunity from our funder, the NIH. They said, do you guys want to do a customer discovery program? We've got this thing called the i which UVA is now a site for that as well, which is look into that, I would guess. But um, basically, customer discovery is, is take your idea that you think is so great and go talk to your customers and have them tell you how it's not a great idea and then go back and fix it so that they are convinced that it's a good idea and figure out the things about it that really do appeal to them. And so I was on board for this, having no idea that I was leading myself into cold calling and trying to come up with questions that people actually wanted to answer. So in a true testament to early failure, I did my first phone call with a vascular surgeon because was, that's our target market. So these guys are super busy, so I got this guy on his lunch break which was mistake one, number one, don't mess with people's lunches. And pretty much got on the phone, had a long list of really mundane questions. Things like, what catheters do you on, use on this patient? What catheters do you use on that patient? Just trying to get a full background of what he's doing. Two minutes into these boring questions, he stops me and says, Mr. Kilroy, you're wasting my time. You may ask me one more question, make it meaningful. I just asked him the next question on the list. It, it, there's just, I was like on the spot. I had no idea what to do. And I got off the phone and I'm actually cringing right now as I'm telling you this story. I cringed like 10 times harder. I like could not believe how far off the mark I was. Like, ah, oh, what was I thinking? And so by the time I got through that cringing and concluded that, all right, I need to learn something from this, I was then able to get ready for like the next interview and say, okay, well, what did I have to do to change that interview to make the, him answer some of those mundane questions but not bore him out of his mind? And those were things that engineering school did not equip me for, right? And probably any of you who are thinking about this, you're not equipped for this yet, but you figure it out, right? And you spend the time going out and kind of going deeper and deeper into this morass that is entrepreneurship and you kind of pick up the pieces of what you need and you start to build it into something that hopefully you can apply that spark to and create that awe-inspiring blaze that we're all hoping to have. <laughs> anyway, thanks. <laughs>